This announcement is for our church family only. If you would like to give your regular tithes and offerings, you may do so in one of two ways. One, you can bring the offering to the church. Or two, you can give online at the link shown on the screen.
in this crazy world around us that you were in control, that you knew this from the beginning to the end, and that we can just rest in you in Jesus' name. That the world may know, or Faith Lessons by Gray Vanderlaan, and this particular one is walking with the, walking yeah. with the Master, walking with the no, know, walking with God in the desert, walking with God in the desert, and uh, it's a it's a really wonderful uh, uh, topic and timely yeah. for where we're at right now. Amen. Um, we we got the introductory video last week. We'll be watching that again this week, but we're also going to watch the first lesson this week, and uh, it's it's a pretty powerful statement. Um, he was sharing in this introductory video about how God was taking him on his own personal walk through a desert, and that it translated into all of this, and that, that has now become these, uh, these lessons that, that we're going to be sharing. In addition to that, uh, we are changing the way that we do communion, for those of you who may or may not know. We have um, communion cups in individual servings, and so we ask that when you come up for communion, that you only take yours or your family members, take a napkin, two cups, and then go back and sit down, and then open them up. At the same time that you come up, you can also do the offering if you choose, okay? So this would be the time that you bring your offering. We're not going to have the kids come in and bring offerings out to, uh, to, to offering plates up because of the COVID-19 concerns. Um, oh, one last thing talking about COVID-19. We had, during the, uh, the hunkering down time, we had uh, the, set up a 24-7 food distribution point here in our church. We're not, we're not going to be continuing that. Uh, as of this week, the food distribution is now going to be taking place at the community center again once a week. And this time it will be on Tuesdays at 6.30 in the evening, not at 5.30. Okay, so tell your friends about that. I've, unfortunately, I put posters out and I put the wrong date, but the time is right. And so it's Tuesdays, starting this Tuesday, at 6.30 in the evening at the community center. And they're not going to be allowed to come into the building um, as they normally did. Normally they would come in at the south end and come and sit in chairs up in the, in the hallway. And then we'd let them in at the opening time to go get the food. What's going to happen now is they're going to have to actually stay outside the building. They can uh, set, set themselves up if they want to stand in line under the covered walkway if they need to. 
Um, and then we will welcome them in one household at a time through the front door. And then as people are progressing from table to table to table, once they're past a couple, three tables, we'll bring in the next guest, and then the next guest, and then they'll leave out the north door. So it's a little bit different from what we've been doing, and I know a lot of you guys don't participate, but if you could help me to get the word out to our community, because we've had nonstop people for the last month and a half coming to our church to get food every single day, and that's changing as of today. Once, once this service is over with, that door and this door will be locked and signs will be posted saying, come to the community center Tuesday at 6.30. But if you can help us to get that word out, we'd appreciate it. Um, we will continue Sunday morning. Yeah, we will continue as a church to have our Sunday morning food distribution. So you can still go down on Sunday morning and get it, but we are no longer going to have the all week long, 24 hours a day, come anytime you want set up. The distribution to the community will be at the community center Tuesdays at 6:30. Our church community, our church distribution will be uh, Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons right after the church service. All right. Um, I think that's it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, our children's ministry every every couple three months has to do a fundraising event in order to pay for the sponsored child. And so what we're going to be doing in two weeks, I think it is, on the 21st. We're going to have a bake sale uh, immediately following the service, and that's going to be to help fund our children's ministry to sponsor our child over in India. So uh, be prepared in two weeks to have cash with you and eat lots of goodies, or at least just take them home with you. Uh, and we're going to try and raise a couple, three months worth of support. We need to have $30 a month to support uh, Anjali. And uh, right now, it's paid all the way through June, but we're going to have to pay, pick up money for July, August, and September. And that's what we're hoping to do with this big sale. So, all right, go for it. Um,
So, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there's a lot of lies in there. Matter of fact, the enemy of our souls wants us, wants us to believe all the lies. He's got the world full of ideas, like, honestly, Revelation, that's way overstated. But I was thinking this morning that every argument out there is a binary choice. Like, if you're not this, then you're this. If you're not that, then you're this. And the world has gotten to the point where we're so divisive in everything. But God pointed out, it's funny, that when Jesus said, if you're not for me or against me, the world said, oh, there's many paths to God. <laughs> the irony of that. But really, it's just the deception of the devil, the deception of the enemy of our souls. So... I just, I just wanted to share that with you. They're like, yeah, everybody wants to argue in the case. And they want to put us in a box, and they want to tell you that you're right or you're wrong, and there's no in between. There's no, but when it comes to God, don't, don't mess with that, you know, because I have my own way to God. And Jesus was very exclusive, right? He said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So let's go out and share the good news that we don't have to argue amongst ourselves. We can spend all eternity in heaven. As we focus on Christ alone, and that's the next time. Christ alone.
gotta figure it out yet. Natalie's on her horn. Natalie's been practicing. I made her promise that she still has to play her violin in some <laughs> But she loves her horn. So <laughs> I'm still on her.
Okay, if you say it and don't do it, what do we call that? It's a lie, right? If you say it and don't do it, it's a lie. You see the title of this next song, right? Shout. 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 We need to turn up the volume. It's rocks and two rivers now. Get people to stand. What is that? What is that? Raise your microphone sound up there. Oh. Because I'm blasting them off. No, seriously, we're not hearing your, your words. Okay. I'm making that happen. Sorry. So, yeah, no, that's fine. It's, we have a new media question and training. Test one, two, test, check, check, check. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, remember, there's also a men's and a ladies part. So ladies, dig deep. Want to hear your voices, guys, on that part? <laughs> Maybe I'll sing a false note. Maybe I'll sing a false note and I'll leave you alone. And then, the, then verse three is rise up church. That's all of us. So.
this goofy social distancing. I'm not even allowed to get out of my chair until they get up off the platform. That's okay. Praise God. Praise God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. Yes. I am so thrilled that we have our crowd here and more today. Um, today, the Church of the Nazarene, the leaders of the Church of the Nazarene, uh, they sent out a couple, three days ago a notice to pastors around the world. And they asked us uh, to encourage our people, specifically North America, Canada, and, and the United States. They specifically asked that we, as Nazarenes, would spend this day in prayer and fasting because our country is hurting so badly right now. There is so much turmoil, so much stuff going on, and the enemy is doing all that the enemy can to just keep things roiled. To, I mean, it's amazing. Even in my own life, I found myself this week just being aggravated over stuff. Yeah. Wouldn't normally bother me, but I was just angry. And I had to I had to literally be aware of the fact that I was being itched a little bit and yeah. prodded a little bit. I'm like, where in the world is that coming from? Yeah, well, I know where it's coming from. Yeah. It's coming from the enemy of my soul who was trying to defeat me. And so we have been called as Nazarenes to spend time today in prayer and fasting. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop eating. You can fast television, you can fast music, you can fast whatever you want to fast. But I would encourage you to spend time today intentional with intentional prayer over the stuff that's going on in our world. We are in Alaska, so we're we're removed from a lot of that. I mean, we are the very first state that got to open up because our numbers were so were so low. But the reality is, what's going on in the world is going on here too. Yes, it is. Okay? Yes, it is. And I'm not going to talk about specifics, but let me tell you, things that happened in our world in Fairbanks have directly affected my personal life in the last two weeks. You don't need to know the details. You just need to know that your pastor has had a, has a problem going on in his own world as a result of all the turmoil that's going on even in our community. So pray for us. Pray for, our, for my wife and I. Pray for our family. Pray for our church. Pray for our community. Pray for our state. Pray for our nation. Pray for the North American continent. We, it, it's going to take God Amen. moving in a powerful way to break what the enemy is trying to grab hold of. It's going to take God. Because there is so much hurt, and so much angst, and so much trauma. I have relatives down in the lower 48 that are just, I mean, they're, they're, they're so tense just because. And everyone I talk to is the same way. It's like, it's like the whole world, I, I honestly thought, God, wouldn't it be cool if we could just go to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> and get away from this for a while. But that's not the set of, that's not the solving of it. The solving of it. Because literally, when God allows you to go through a trial of some sort, when God allows you to walk through a crucible, there's a reason for it. And you need to recognize that God is still sovereign. God is still in charge. God is not surprised by anything that's going on. And one of the things God needs from us, now I'm not preaching yet, but I'm preaching, because <laughs> one of the things God needs from us is we need to partner with Him. Yes. He, for whatever reason, has chosen to, to work through God's people. And so God asks us to be the hands and feet of Christ. God asks us to pray for people. God can do it without our prayers, but God asks us to pray. And so, I, and for whatever reason, God uses our prayers, God uses our, our acts of sacrifice, and he, he moves in powerful ways when we do it. I don't fully understand it. I just know that that's how it works. And so I'm asking you to join me in this day, somehow, some way today, spend some time in sacrificial prayer and fasting if you can over what's going on, the pain that's in people's hearts the pain that's in our culture, the pain that's in our society, 
and the confusion that is being caused by all of it. Because the enemy is trying very hard to steal, kill, and destroy. But we already have some this morning. We know who's in charge. We know what we believe. We know when that last song, Oceans, that we sang, when, when we see ourselves out, it says, I'm going to keep my eyes above the waves. If you remember the story of Peter, when he walked on water, he was doing great until he stopped looking at Jesus. Once he started looking at the waves, he went, oh. And that's when he lost his faith and he started to sink. And that's exactly what God is asking us to do. Yes, everything's in turmoil. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's still a pandemic going on. Yes, there's brokenness. Yes, there's division. But God is still God, and we need to keep our eyes focused on Him and Him alone and walk the path that He's asking us to do. And so we're going to spend some time this morning praying specifically for our country, for our nation, for our community, for the people, in our, even in our community that are hurting right now. That are, that are in so much turmoil and so much pain. Like I said, I can't share with you the details because it wouldn't be fair, but I have people in my own life who are impacted by all this stuff that's going on right now. And so I you to join us in prayer. We're going to pray for a few moments for our nation, for our country, for our city, for our community, and then after that we'll start doing personal prayers and just call them out as we normally do and understand as we're video recording it, I will be editing out all the prayer time so that we don't violate anybody's privacy. So don't feel, feel awkward about praying out loud because that will all be edited from our, from our video recording. But let's go to the Father right now. God, your word declared. We read it this morning in Psalm 8. Let me just read that again, God. I want to read it aloud to us because these are the words that I felt very powerfully in my spirit that you wanted were spoken over your people. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens and out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is humanity that you're mindful of us? The son of man that you care for. Yet you have made us a little lower than the heavenly beings, the angels and all of the people, all of the, the beings in heaven. You have crowned us with honor and glory. You have given us dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under our feet, except for you and you alone. All the sheep of the earth, all the oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Lord, we have dominion over all that, but you are over us and we trust you, God. We look to you and we declare, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so, God, we submit ourselves before you this morning. And we declare that we are people of God. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We submit to you. We acknowledge that you are present in our lives, that you, we have repented of our sins. We have confessed our sins. We walk in integrity, honor, and holiness and righteousness because we want to submit to you and we want to bring glory to your name. And we want to see the advancement of the kingdom of God in our community. And God, right now, we just humbly come before you, Lord. If I had sackcloth to put on, if I could tear my clothes and, and just humble myself before you, God, in that way, I would do it. Because we desperately need you to bring healing. There's hurt. There's anger. There's concern. There's despair. There's frustration. There's fear, and God, all of that, all of that is being fomented by the enemy's activity in our lives, and we just ask God that you would stop it right now in the name of Jesus. That you would bring peace and wholeness and restoration and healing, because God, there are people out there who have been so badly hurt that they need a healing touch from you. They need their minds calm. They need their spirits calm. They need you to bolster them up and encourage them. Father, the words of St. Francis' prayer, where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there are doubts, let me sow faith. Where there is darkness, let me sow light. Where there is despair, let me sow hope. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled myself, but that I can console others. Yes. 
Help me to not seek to be understood myself, but help me to understand others. Help me to not seek to be loved, but help me to love others. Where there is sadness, God, let me sow joy. Father, we understand and know that you alone are our rock, our source, our foundation, our protection. We submit to you, we come before you, and we plead with you on behalf of the peoples of the North American continent in Canada and the United States, Lord God. Right now, we need you to minister, to bring healing, to give wisdom. Father God, we pray for the governmental leaders. We pray, God, for the, for this, uh, the, 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 the federal, state, and local leaders. We pray, Father God, for the ministry leaders around this nation and around Canada. Father, we ask that you would give each one of us discernment, understanding, and wisdom as we try to minister to our communities. Father, in each of our cases, as we have access to lives around us, we ask, God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, empower us with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, and may we show that to the people around us. And Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear when the enemy is trying to cause harm. Help us to recognize it and to, in the power of the name of Jesus, to renounce it, to walk away from it, and to not allow it to have any access to us. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. And we trust you, God, for what you are going to do in the days to come. Father, I lift up. Lord God, into your hand, we commit all of this. We know that you've heard us, and we know that your promises are true, and you will respond to every single one of these requests. And we trust you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Join with us as we say the words that our Lord taught his disciples to say when they asked him, how should we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you're under the age of 12, and you want to come on up, I'd love to have you guys come on up and sit on the carpet here in front. I'm going to go get myself. Having to learn all the kids to come. Come on up, guys. Having to learn to stand as close to this table as possible so that if I get too far out, I'm out of the screen. Come on up and take a seat just on the carpet. It's fine. Come on. Hey, welcome back. I haven't seen you guys for a long time. How was Florida? Was it good? But you guys got stuck there because you couldn't travel through the country because everyone was hovering down. Hello, Miss Mariah. I like your mask. That's pretty. Well, listen. I have a question for you guys. How many of you guys like winter time? Do you like winter time? With all the snow and with all of the ice and stuff. That's my, I love winter time. My wife thinks I'm crazy. She likes summertime because she likes to have all the sunlight, but I like winter time. Actually, my favorite time of the year is, is if, if we could live in September all year long, that would be the best, best, best time. You know why? Because there's not as much hot, and there's not so deep, deep cold, and it's nice and brisk and cool. And one of the cool things I like when it's a, a brisk time is I like to go set up a little campfire out back here, and we just sit on chairs and visit. Maybe we roast hot dogs or something. But one of the coolest things about having a campfire is what? What do you think would be a wonderful thing about having? Uh, 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 in a tent. Yeah, you can go camping in a tent and have a campfire right by your tent. When you're sitting around a campfire, what do some people do though? They get sticks and they put something on the stick. Marshmallows. Marshmallows. Yum, yum. Now, I couldn't find in my house big marshmallows. I only found these little, so I'd have to find a really tiny little stick to put these marshmallows.
marshmallows on. But what else goes with marshmallows and campfires? Hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. You mean like that? And a uh, uh, s'more. The cookie. And the cookie? You mean so like if I took a graham crackers and some chocolate and some uh, marshmallows and I took them out to the campfire and I melt, got the marshmallows all melty and then I put a piece of chocolate on the cookie and then I put the marshmallow on it and I put another cookie on it and squish it all together and that's called what? S'more. It's called a s'more. Can you have a s'more without a graham cracker? Yes. You can? Like if I don't have a graham cracker, is that a s'more? Yes, yes. It's messy, it's messy though. It's messy though. Just put the chocolate on the hot marshmallow and burn your fingers while you're trying to eat it? Okay, what if I only had just a candy bar? Would that be a s'more? No. That would just be chocolate, right? What if I had just the marshmallows? Would that be a s'more? No. What if I had just the crackers, the, the, the graham crackers? Would that be a s'more? No. So this, these are graham crackers, and I like graham crackers. I eat them all the time. I think they're great. And I like marshmallows a little bit by themselves, not too much. I could eat them, but I don't really love. I love, love, love chocolate by itself. But if you have all of them together, that makes a s'more. It's glorious, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's praiseworthy. And you know what? You know what's really cool? When you're sitting around a campfire and you're making s'mores, you can tell people about God. Did you know that? No. How could you do that? Think about this. What do we know about God and how s'mores are like God? Go ahead. The adults are all going, what? I don't know, what? <laughs> what? Okay, let me share with you something. The cracker, the marshmallows, and the chocolate are three distinct and separate things. But when you put them all together, they form one thing. And we believe in God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when you're having s'mores, you can say, hey, this reminds me about God. And people at the campfire will go, what? <laughs> and you'll say, God the Father is kind of like the crackers because it surrounds everything. And uh, Jesus, because Jesus sacrificed himself, he broke himself so that I could have a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit of God oozes everywhere and flows everywhere and binds us all together. So these three things, crackers that are separate and unto themselves, chocolate that is separate, it is chocolate, marshmallows that are separate and unto themselves, but when you bring all three of them together, they are a s'more. And God is God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, and they are all one. And that's how you can tell people about God when you're having s'mores around the campfire. And I wish we could just go have a s'more right now. <laughs> but I have to preach, and you have to go sit back with your parents, okay? Sorry. <laughs> okay, you guys go sit down with your folks, and I'm gonna come back up here. Talk about God over here. Well, if you guys haven't got it yet, we're talking about God this morning. <laughs> but we're talking specifically about some of the things that we understand about God this morning. And there has been, I, I am one who loves symbology. I love iconography. I don't know if you've ever heard of those terms, but I love having symbols that represent God to me. I am very much, that's how I worship. I mean, I, I, I like to focus on something that makes me think about God, okay? Well, there's been something in front of you all morning long that you haven't paid any attention to. It's an ancient symbol that reminds us about God. And it's right up there on that green screen. 
Does anybody know what that's called? That symbol at the top? Oh, that's a Star Trek thing, isn't it? Where they get yeah. the dress pose and beat me up? Not Star Trek. <laughs> what is that? What is that? Does anybody know what that's called? It's a tri qua tra. Tri qua tra. T R I Q U E T R A. It is an ancient symbol. Now, I have to tell you the truth. It is not unique to Christianity. There are other religions around the world who use this symbol for their worship, but Christians have used this symbol since before the year 500, I think. And what it is, if you look at it, there are three distinct points, but they are all connected, and there's a circle which represents eternal or eternity. But one of the things that's, that's interesting, and you can't really see it, and I wish that I had a pointer that I could actually point to, but look at the top point on that. Okay? See how it's formed by two rounded lines, right? The point at the top, if you follow that down, it comes down two rounded lines, and then they cross again, and then they go opposite and connect with the circle again. You see that? Okay, look at the top again. See it's formed at, by, by two lines touching. Then follow those two lines down, they curve a little bit, then the two lines cross, and they come and touch the circle again. That symbol is a fish. That's an ancient Christian symbol. It used to be back in the early days of the church, when the church was being persecuted, if you wanted to identify yourself to another person as being a believer, you would, with your toe, make half of the fish in the sand and then keep the conversation going. And if the person who was talking to you was a Christian, they would complete that fish symbol by making the other half of the fish in the sand. And if they didn't respond, you would just casually wipe out your line with your foot and as if it never happened, just continue on the conversation. But if they did the other half of the fish, then you silently communicated with each other, I'm a believer in Jesus, I'm a follower. That's an ancient, ancient symbol. So the fish is an ancient symbol. Now, look up there, it's hard to see, but the top point is a fish. Now go to the one on the left and follow it. It's a fish. Now we'll go to the one on the right and follow the lines on that. It's a fish. So we have three distinct individual fish <clears throat> touching and intersecting each other, totally encircled in the circle, which represents God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one entity made up of three entities, fully eternal. It's a cool symbol. No, it is not. It, it fails. I mean, there are things you could, you, well, God isn't just, right? of course, because God is everything. God is more. But this is one symbol that Christians have used for thousands of years to talk about our faith. One of the key things that we say we believe. Last week, when we were reading the readings in the sanctuary, one of the things we read was the Nicene Creed. If you remember, the Nicene Creed says, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus the Son, the only begotten of the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's basic to our Christian faith. And it's known in theological terms as the Trinity. Now, if you do a word search right now on your little electronic Bible and type in Trinity and say, look for this in the Bible, you will come up with zero. No hits, because the word Trinity never appears in the Bible. So where did we get this idea? Hmm. Well, look at the screen right now. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, sitting right in front of you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, where? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. 
Right there, the words of Jesus himself giving instruction to his disciples as he's getting ready to go back to be with the Father, and the Holy Spirit is about to be imparted to the church, and the words are given to the, to the leaders of the, of the fledgling church, you now have the responsibility to go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Baptizing them in the name of the Trinity. Now, we don't see the word Trinity in the Bible, but there's very clearly Trinity shown to us in the Bible. If you look, we mentioned this last week. Galatians chapter 4. Go ahead and turn to it, because I don't have a screen, unfortunately. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4, 5, and 6. I'll turn with you. Romans, Corinthians, 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 Galatians, chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4, 5, and 6. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God, the Father, has sent the Spirit of his Son to redeem, excuse me, uh, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So right there, without using the word Trinity, God said through the Apostle Paul, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, when I was a young Christian and I read this passage for the very first time, or maybe not the very first time, but when I was studying it early on in my faith, I was like, God sent the Spirit of His Son? Hmm. I thought the Holy Spirit was separate, a separate entity, the Spirit of His Son. And that really threw me for a while. And I was like, God, I want you to show me what you mean by this. Because driving crazy, I can't figure it out. And what the Lord said to me was, you and every other Christian that's ever walked the face of the earth. Don't think you're going to get an answer. Because <laughs> that ain't coming. <laughs> when you get up there with us, me, us, me, us, me, <laughs> you'll get it. It's just frustrating because I want to reason it out. I want to know. I want to understand. I want to be able to explain my faith to other people. And when I have to say, I don't know, it makes me look stupid. <laughs> Come, somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor, can you tell me blah, 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 blah? Sure, let me show you in the Bible where it says blah, blah, blah. And this is what the Bible meant when it said blah, blah, blah. Well, it doesn't give me that answer. The closest I can come, if you'll turn with me, look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 30. It's a very easy, 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 easy thing. Jesus is talking, and he says in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. What? How? I don't know. I've never been given that answer. I'm just asked to believe it. Yeah. And you know what happened when Jesus said those words? They tried to kill him. Because they didn't like his words. And they couldn't accept those words. Because it went against whatever they were trying to understand. And whatever they were trying to believe. And see, God does not give us all the answers. God doesn't give us all the information because God expects us to take some of this on faith. Well, that's very disgusting. Because 
I want to know. I want to be able to talk about what I believe, and I don't want to look stupid when I'm trying to tell people what I believe. Because in, in our culture, I'm not really received that well anymore as a Christian. And so I don't want to look stupid and foolish when people who aren't followers of the Lord Jesus Christ say, well, how in the world can you believe that? I want to be able to prove to them how I can believe that. But there are certain things that God has done and how God has revealed to God, to the world, that God doesn't give all the details. And we have to just accept that. And this is one of those things. We, as Christians, state in our theology, we believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And nobody can figure it out. We just know that that's the truth. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. He asks you to simply accept it. And I know that there are going to be people that you come across in today's world as you're trying to share your faith with people. And they love the story that Jesus loves and that Jesus welcomes and that Jesus accepts. And a little bit of what Roy said this morning, Jesus is the only way. Well, that's kind of getting a little bit not so acceptable. But this idea of three and one, come on, if you can't explain what you believe, I don't even want to hear it. And you have to accept and understand that even the greatest theologians who've ever lived on the face of the earth since the time of Jesus have not been able to explain it, even though they have studied and studied and studied and studied. So don't let that shut you up. Amen. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know that your sins are forgiven because of the blood of Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit of God present with you because you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, and you are walking in the power and the strength of God, then you can know with confidence that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is present with you, walking with you, forgiving you, empowering you, and is going to welcome you someday into God's presence. And while you're still on this earth, you have a responsibility. And what is it? To make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whether they understand it or not. Teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded and helping them to understand that because God the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, they can know that God will be present with them until the end of the age. That's what we believe. That's what we state. That's what we understand to the best of our understanding. And the last thing I wanted to share with you before we close this time and go to the, to the taking of the, of the bread and the juice. Every single Sunday, as we close our worship service, I stand before you and I give a benediction. And that benediction is straight out of the scriptures. If you'll turn to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 14. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians, but every Sunday I pronounce this benediction over you. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Right out of Scripture, the Trinity is identified very clearly. Just because you can't necessarily explain it doesn't mean it's not real. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of taking it by faith. And you probably will never convince another human being that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because that's not your job. Amen. Your job is to speak it. Your job is to live it. Your job is to help them to understand it's God's job to convict and to convince. And so our job is simply to continue to walk in this. So let's close our time of teaching and go into the time of communing with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit this morning as we take our communion. 
And because we have visitors, I want to share with you guys how we do this in the Church of the Nazarene. We believe that this meal is for everybody who names Jesus as their Savior. You don't have to be a member of this congregation. You don't have to be a member of our denomination. As long as you know Jesus as your Savior, as long as you are right in your relationship with God, that you walked in here, you may have even walked in here with some sin in your life, but you can confess it between now and then, and you can say, God, I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed, and I want to partake of this bread and this juice. Now, this is bread, it's just regular bread, and it's just grape juice. It's not wine, because we don't, we are, we are Nazarenes and we don't drink alcohol. <laughs> but the real, I do my job, I serve alcohol. So. <laughs> But what we've done is, because of the COVID-19 thing, we have put all of the bread and all the juice in separate containers. The person who prepared it was wearing gloves and mask, and they followed all the safety protocols. Um, there's a napkin underneath each of the cups. So what we're going to ask is, as you come forward, if you will take your cup of juice and your cup of bread and your napkin and go back and sit down in your seat, and then open it up. And the reason for that is, as the, jostle, as the juice gets jostled, it gets up on the lid, you open it up, and it's going to go everywhere. So that way you've got the little napkin to clean up, clean your hands. But also, we just don't want grape juice everywhere. Um, you're welcome to come up as a family unit if you choose to. Um, that's also going to be the time when you're going to give your offering if you choose to give an offering. And again, just drop it in the basket. That's why we're not passing the baskets anymore because of the COVID-19 thing. So you're all welcome if you choose to come. We're going to pray a blessing in just a moment. You can come up as you feel led, but kind of give space for people, socially distancing, please. And then we'll just enjoy the presence of God as we take part in this communion. Let me come on around to the other side of the table. Oh, reading! Yeah! I'll sit down. Thank you, Ellen. I have a job to do. Okay, this reading is uh, Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That was a good word. We need to hear it. Amen. I'm glad everyone is forcing me enough to tell the pastor to shut up and sit down. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> uh, this way. Otherwise, I'll mess myself up. On the night, on the night before the day before Jesus was betrayed. He gathered together with his friends, and had a fellowship meal together. And during that meal, sometime, he broke the tradition, he held up a piece of bread, and he broke it. Yeah. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take it, eat it, all of you. Later on in that meal, he held up a cup. In the tradition of that culture, during that time of the meal, the cup that he held up was known as the cup of redemption, which is just a God thing in my mind. And he held this cup up and he said, this is my blood, my life, which is shed for you. Take this, all of you, drink it. And later on he said, guys, what I just did with you this, this evening, I want you to carry this with you Whenever you get together, whenever you have opportunity, I want you to get some bread, I want you to get a cup of juice or wine, whatever you're choosing, and I want you to remember what we did tonight. This is very important in what we say we believe. The, well, the body of Jesus was broken for us. The blood of Christ was shed for us. Why? Because we 
had rebelled against God. We were sinners. We were out of fellowship with God, and the only way to make it right was for God to send his one and only son to die on a cross that whoever believes in Jesus might have eternal life and might be declared righteous before God. And so this morning, Father, we ask that you would bless this bread, bless this juice, nourish our bodies with it, but nourish our spirits with it as well, God. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. We thank you, God, and we understand to the level that we're able to that this is not a, anything more than a symbol that represents to us what you did for us on the cross and how you raised Jesus to life and how Jesus is now seated at the right hand, making intercession on our behalf. And so, Father God, as we come before this table and we take the bread and we take the juice, we just ask, God, that you would just do something miraculous in our spirits. You would move in a powerful way however you see fit, God. We're doing this in obedience. We're doing this to honor you. But we know that we're going to get so much more out of it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come when you're ready. You got it in
Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We, we submit to you, Lord. You are God. We are not. We want to walk in integrity before you as we walk before our people of our community. And we ask God that you would give us opportunity to speak truth and to speak life and to speak hope to the people we meet in the coming days. And may we always give glory to you through all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. Go in his peace.